Welcome to the Poundcast. Another great show today, Brent. Don't you think? Certainly, man. We there's we learned some interesting stuff. I think. Yeah, we it was a fascinating episode. We caught up with our old friend Jason Walliner. Jason, if you don't know who he is, he is the director most recently of Borat. Um, but also the new Borat, the new Borat film, and he also he direct like like you'll learn he directed everything, Human Giant. Uh, the Brett uh, Gellman specials, the Brett Gellman specials and Eagleheart, among other other things. And he was a child actor. We're going to learn about that. We're going to learn about when he met Ringo Starr and toured with Ringo. He and went on tour with the Beatle. One of, uh, with the Beatle. Yeah. With the Beatle. The Beatle. With the Beatle. <laughs> yeah. The Beatle. He said, "Yeah. I, oh, actually, I went on. I actually went on tour with the Beatle." Oh, with the Beatles? <laughs> no, no, the Beatle. Just the Beatle. One, the Beatle. Just one, yeah. Just one. <laughs> Look, the point is, it's a great episode. I think you're going to like it. Yeah. And, um, and then for, yeah. And, uh, but first, before we get into, well, I'll say this. And if you do want to get in on, um, and if you want to hear more, we have an After Dark episode and with a little pop-in guest with uh, Nick Rutherford actually pops in yeah, for a so, second. Yeah, after we talk to Jason, we talk for another Almost an hour, really. Yeah, a long time. And the only way to access that and support us, well, one of the ways to support us is join our Patreon page, patreon.com slash poundcast. And for as little as $2 a month, you can have access to the bonus After Dark episodes. If you want the video, $5 a month. But yeah, no big whoop. Yeah, because we're on YouTube now, youtube.com slash the poundcast. Isn't that right, Brent? That's right. And we do have our favorite sponsor. They are sponsoring us this week. They are that's Louisville, Louisville Vegan, Vegan Foods. Louisville, Louisville Vegan Foods. Vegan Foods. Com. And that's Louis. They do Louisville Vegan Jerky. They have a different. Uh, it's meat free jerky, different flavors. It's handbag in the United States. It's um, has a nine month shelf life. Um, you got to get it while it's hot or cold. <laughs> <laughs> get it, get it either way. Yeah. And uh, it's got, they got different flavors such as Carolina barbecue and they've perfect got pepperoni. pepperoni and yeah, they have a bacon flavor. And anyway, you can go to the website, you can get it at the stores, but you can also go to the website, louisvillevegan.com and you can, um, whatever order you do, if you use the code word poundcast, you get, guess how much off? 20%. You got it. <laughs> I don't, you I don't got know it. Said, you got it. I don't Dude, know they got buffalo dill as one of their main flavors. I mean, these are good flavors, okay? You and really they, can't go you can't go I'm wrong. I'm looking at their site right now. Uh what do they have? Cherry Chipotle is still on on the site. 20% oh, off wow. of that. Man, they got some flavors. My mouth is starting to water. Well, you better just get your butch over there to louisvilleveganfoods.com and check it out. They also have chocolate as well. Yeah, and or just go to a store such as Whole Foods or yeah. Sprouts. Just and, and anyways, um, look, I think that's all we have to mention. We want to, you know, we, we, let's get ready for this episode. Let's go. Oh, we, you know, um, we got a remix here. Some of our um, Patreon users they do remixes of the theme song for the pound cast. And there's one here we have for this one. And it is from Sam B. Sam B is the one who did this one. Yeah. I, if you subscribe to the Patreon, uh, I put the stems up of the song that I spent so much time making crafting and the remixes are, to be honest, they're better than my original song. I just made a song so people can remix it. And the remixes have been fantastic. And let's right. listen to the and, new one by Sam B. And sorry, right before we do that, I want to just say one thing, and I'm forgetting now what I wanted to say, but I'll just say this, that there is also a Poundcast <laughs> Instagram account called The Poundcast and also a Twitter account called The, tw called the Twitter. <laughs> no, it's called The Poundcast. And, um, oh, no, what did I want to say? Oh, well, I forgot. Anyway, we'll move Legacy, on. Legacy, what do you want to talk about? Legacy. No, no, no. It's, it has nothing to do with any other side part. It's, just, it's only like, it's only Poundcast related. Um, but it's, now I'm forgetting what it, what, I, what it is, what it was, but it's okay though, you know? 
Um, it's okay. They yeah, just want to. They just wanted to listen to us talk to Jason, and they want to hear this remix. Let's get into this. Let's get into it. Let's let's roll the tape. Let's roll the Sam B remix. And uh, oh, this is what I was going to say. We're also on Discord, so you can find the Discord. Just I don't know where you find it, but you get on it and you do it. You know. Do you yeah. know how to get on it? Yeah, hit us up if you want to know how to do it. I'm on it right now. It's called Poundcast. No, you have to be invited, though. You got to get the link. Well, anyway, let's put it how. in the show description of this show. How about okay. that, right? We'll do. We'll do. We will do that. We will do such a thing. Okay. And now, Sam B, you're on. Roll the clip. Welcome to the Poundcast, Jason Wolliner. Welcome to the show. Thanks for basic as that, you know, simple as that. Thanks for having me on. (laughs) (laughs) So for those who don't know. Was that it? Was that it? Are we done? That's it. You know, we're good. That's it. Thanks for listening. um, Now we can move on. You guys will edit it. It'll sound great. Yeah. It'll be like a conversation. Well, we stretch it out in the, in the post, you know, we just. You know what I mean? We just uh, we slow it down. We do a tiny speed. Stretch. We change the speed. We do a uh, minus, you know, I don't know, if, what six hundred percent or something like that. That's cool. A cool yeah, make it fun. Make that's me funny. A, that's a good podcast idea. I don't think anyone's ever done that, you know. But just a really short conversation, really slowed down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well. Jason, I haven't seen you in a while, and of all the friends that I um, have haven't seen in a while on COVID, you're the most uh, clean cut. Usually, everyone has long hair and a beard, but you're looking uh, pretty tight. Oh, thanks. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, there's a lot of uh, words buzz going on for uh, the, the Borat movie, so I, I just uh, I had to do some zooms, uh, so I shaved. Uh, awards oh. buzz. <laughs> um, they're trying to get uh all right i think you know she deserves but yeah you have you talk to people or you film these things and uh maybe uh you know there's there's some chatter around uh the actor who plays borat's daughter maybe she'll get some kind of uh award <laughs> great for her she certainly deserves it so uh yeah there's you, you talk to people and you zoom and uh it's a whole world of, of stuff uh, yeah, so we might as well talk about Borat for those well, who well, don't course, know. People, for people for those who don't know who Jason is, uh, Jason he's, is an, he's an actor who appeared in the Borat. Off. He, he's an actor who appeared in the Borat movie as the guy uh, asking to take a picture. Yeah, that's primarily <laughs> for uh, yeah the guy with Tom Hanks. Uh, Jason was also the director. So you yep. put yourself in the movie, much like Hitchcock. <laughs> Very much like Hitchcock. And uh, so you you were the director of Borat, and I guess we might as well get some questions about that out of the way, because now now you can talk about it a little bit. I know uh, some other friends that worked on the worked on that movie, and they they never said they couldn't say anything about it. But now people were good. Yeah, we we had a few of our friends uh, come in. Uh, Eric Natarnicola was very uh, he didn't get a full editing credit, but he was very instrumental in the editing, helping helping figure everything out. Uh, Dan Longino also worked on it a bit. Uh, some some writer friends of ours uh, came in. Uh, yeah, it was we, we got to kind of use some of our our crew. Just Mike Giambra. Oh yeah, Giambra of course is uh, is one of the three full editors on it, and Mike uh, was hugely important in figuring out uh, the movie. So yeah, Mike. Yeah, that. I, I got to say these guys didn't say a word, and I was like. You know, not even on my podcast. I was just like, come on. <laughs> What's up with Giuliani? And he's like, I can't say anything. I'm like, all right. Well, that's cool. Good. Good for- <laughs> just just so you know, you 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 know, your boys are are uh there's no rats, not a rat in the bunch. 
So that's good. Yeah, we we uh, well, it sounds like you guys were doing good rat testing. <laughs> so as okay, I have a couple questions here. When it when it when you're putting the the edit together, are you forming some of the story like in post because the nature of the film or is it some, what was written was it a lot of it was written ahead of time and then you really kind of uh nailed what you were going for i'm tr- uh most of it was figured out story-wise from pretty early on the biggest change was uh covid happened in the middle of shooting and then we had to figure out how to kind of change. But even that, like, we always wanted him to, we, we knew that he and his daughter were going to, you know, kind of split apart. And originally he was going to find these, like, men's rights guys and and try and, and live with them. So this is before lockdown or anything. And then COVID happened and we are like, oh, that, he could just lock down with some, some Trump guys and uh, stuff like that. So we kind of took ideas that we had and then sh- reshaped it to what the, the situation of the world was. Um, but then there are also like lots of scenes and story directions and things that we shot and, uh, and just kind of realized we didn't want to go in that direction and threw it out and, and shot other stuff. Yes, Brent. Question. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> this is a question I had about Borat that maybe you can answer. Well, maybe you won't be able to answer this. Maybe you're not allowed to, but what was the setup? What were the two men that, he stays with exactly i was gonna ask this but were were they told um we're shooting a reality show where you you live with a foreigner during during COVID 19 or like what were they told that they were gonna meet this guy and have them have him live with them yeah that's basically it they everyone in the movie knows that they're involved in like a documentary style project basically everyone knows they're on camera but you know we had to so there's not a lot of like hidden camera in the movie the only thing that's really hidden there's like a couple hidden scenes that the, the, um, the plastic surgeon guy was not aware that he was on camera. The guy who says all those insane things. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, but those guys knew they were part of like a film project and uh, would be living with a foreign guy. And we had ways of like, with everyone in the movie, this kind of very delicate long process of kind of figuring out if people know who Sasha is, know who Borat is without them like, being aware that they're that that's being determined obviously so that what, what yeah. was the show or documentary that they were told they were going to be a part of i you know we always come up with like fake names of projects i don't remember it might have been something called like american lockdown or something or we're like yeah we wanted to like bring a guy in who's from another country who doesn't know about what's going on here and you know this guy is here and we're filming with him and this crazy COVID thing's happening. And so we were wondering if you guys could all live together and then you can kind of share your, your cultural, you know, perspectives on COVID, on everything, on what's going on. Yeah. Where, where was this posted? You know, how did they, those guys find out about it? That's the part that I actually, we have a whole team that kind of goes in the world and finds real people. And like, that's the part that um, I don't really know exactly the nitty gritty of like, cause these guys, we have like a field team basically. And, they have a million different ways of finding people. So I don't know where those specific guys were found. Sometimes it's like Craigslist or sometimes they're like, in, they'll just go into bars for a month and hang out and be like, oh, that guy looks good. And just like chat up strangers and be like, hey, I'm working on this project. Would you be interested in filming? And it's just like so much, so much time invested uh, that these people do. And and then after that, you know, there's like only a, tiny sliver of a percentage of the population that's both willing to participate in something like this and also is good on camera is like you know kind of has like a sense of self is smart and and good will be good in the scene as the right type of person for the scene and also doesn't know who Borat is so like that's kind of why it took a year to film is because we had to find people that fit all that criteria yeah that was going to be my follow-up question was like because a lot of my friends or people I also saw the movie that when we were discussing it, they're like, those guys, like they were fake, right? They were, they were in on it. And I'm, and my, my radar didn't go off that these, that this was these, these guys were some kind of actors. I was like, no, I think those guys are real and they really don't know who Borat is. So can you confirm? I can confirm those guys did not know who Borat is. Those guys were a hundred percent real. Like I, I don't know where I'd swear on whatever. Like, yeah, those guys were real. They did not know they were with the character. 
uh, they really cared about him, cared about helping him find his daughter. Uh, yeah, it's um, guys like that or the Janice uh, who babysits uh, Tutar. We were like, oh man, these guys are so perfect that people are going to think we hired actors because like it, it all worked out so well. And we had to kind of figure out ways. And this is the thing like on Nathan for you. I remember Nathan talking about this on the episodes I worked on and, and then Tarnacola and Jabra. Like just like sometimes it works so well that you have to figure out ways in the edit to make sure that people know that, um, that these are real people. Yeah. Yeah. And then so with the daughter, I thought she was she probably does deserve an award. She was amazing. Where did you find her? Um, yeah, she was living in, Bul she's Bulgarian. She was just, uh, she was an actor. She's never done comedy. She's been in like indie movies and pretty heavy dramas uh, in Bulgaria. And there's like not a lot of cultural crossover. And we just, we, we had tapes sent in from like 600 people, I think. And I watched all of them and we just thought, oh yeah, she's, super funny and seems real that was the other thing like we we did like a lot of testing with um different actresses like in the real world with real people to see like if they could kind of do what sasha does um and usually people would be like what is this you're you're bore adding me or whatever like people it's so hard to do that because if you say one thing that sounds too much like a written joke people are just like what is this prank but that never happened with Maria. Yeah, we because she's like so real. Yeah. Um, how do you? How can you tell from a tape sent in that she's gonna have the the guts or the balls to like do that stuff in public? And you know, because that's 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 the real skill. I think is like holding it together and committing when you when you're kind of you know pranking people. Or, yeah. you know, like, how, how do you, how can you tell that she has, that she can pull that off? Then from the, I mean, from that audition tape, we just thought she was really funny and, and had a funny energy and, and seemed real and also could pass for a teenager. And so then we flew her to uh, London and flew Sasha there. And then they did some tests with like real people to see like if she would joke or whatever. And, uh, and it was just them kind of goofing around in the house with this older English couple who, uh, yeah, again, we're told some story about it being a documentary and she's like in a dog cage and like can't, it's like never seen steps before and trying to like get up a staircase and <laughs> okay, yeah, she could do that. And then, uh, and then basically, then we, we did another one where I went out there and they tried some of the more like acting kind of emotional stuff. And then it, it, we hired her and, and it took like a month and a half to get her a work visa. So she came and was like shooting with us like two days later, with no, rehearsal or, or anything we kind of just jump right in yes brian um so uh <laughs> that's what we have to do because we'll we'll keep talking over each other <laughs> oh yeah oh <laughs> so uh by the way i talked over you when you were introducing jason because i wanted to get the joke in about i know him. well now i realize that you were getting that joke in before we you got gotcha. before you said yeah. he was the I know. director i, wanted I know to say, i know okay. i get it anyway um so that that kind of event that happened uh, outdoors that was that that right event or whatever where Sasha Baron Cohen plays in, with the band I think or, or whatever and those two guys come with him. How much was that event produced by the production of the movie? Because I noticed that you know Billy Wayne Davis, who I he probably did some writing on the on the movie or something. He was in it as the announcer who and it brings Sasha Baron Cohen on, who's a comedian. For those who don't know. And so then I was wondering how much was, you know, how, how much was the production of the movie? Was that whole event produced by the movie? That's my question. We kind of infiltrated a real event that was already happening. We saw this event was going on in Washington. That was, uh, it was like a, uh, it, was, it was called the March for Our Rights. That was in response to the March for Our Lives that those Parkland kids did. That they like, you know, they started this like gun control movement called the March for Our Lives because they saw all their friends get like shot. And then these guys were like, we got to stop those kids. <laughs> so they made the March for Our Rights. And this was like the third or fourth year or so they were doing it. We saw this thing, we're like, oh. And then because of COVID, it became like uh, partially like also like anti-lockdown, anti-mask rally. Um, and we were in the middle, we were kind of getting going again after this like break we had from COVID. So we saw this event 
And this is all documented out there on the internet. It's the only reason I can talk about it is like, because the guys kind of went forward uh, with like how, from their perspective, what happened, which is basically this organization that was us, they didn't know, uh, contacted them and say, you know, we want to help your guys group with your event. So we like paid for the stage. Um, so the event was already happening, but we kind of like, kind of helped them with a little bit. And so we paid for the stage. And as a result, we were able to put our own band that had already you know, secretly rehearsed the song, our own MC. We were able to kind of pull some strings and engineer it because we knew we wanted Sasha to get on stage. So it's a real event that we infiltrated, but we did it in a way that uh, we could get the footage that we, we wanted for the scene. Um, so you kind of co-produced that event. I mean, or the production of the movie did sort of. More or less, yeah. Which was, I mean, to me, like the, the best part of reading the aftermath of that was like the guys who, it was their event, they, they you know, people in the audience, like, there might have been like some undercover Black Lives Matter people there who were also trying to infiltrate the event and they, is what I heard, recognized Sasha and like started saying his name through like, hang on, this is not like a right wing singer, this is someone making fun of us. And they got mad and like we're trying to get, they were trying to like get on stage, but it was our security. <laughs> and so like the organizers come over and they're like they try to pull the power uh from the generator and this in these like big samoan security guards are standing in their way and they're like hey this is our event let us in there we're gonna we gotta shut this off and the security guards are like you didn't pay us <laughs> and they're like what so the guys thought it was their event but they couldn't get on stage um at that point and that's and, and then eventually the crowd did store in the stage and we put uh I think Sasha's Twitter, there's some, there's a little iPhone video I shot of us like trying to escape in this ambulance and they're like ripping doors open and stuff. It was, it was dicey, but, um, but yeah, yeah, basically we, we wound up co-producing without them being aware of what we were. Just to, just to follow up on that, did you um, have, um, it seems so unbelievable, but I, you know, it, it, I don't know how it couldn't be, is that these, just outrageous lyrics that he was having them sing along with, you know, that were just super, just, you know, offensive lyrics. They seemed to be genuinely singing along with them or were they, or did they think this was a comedy act and they were like a right wing comedy act and they were singing along as a joke or something or what, or what was going on there really? I mean, that because like legally, because we're showing real people's faces, we couldn't manipulate that footage at all in terms of like taking something someone was singing and putting it in another part to make them look bad so like in the movie everything you see is exactly at the moment like they're singing along exactly in response to what he just said so in terms of like their psychology whether they thought it was like i mean yeah if they're smiling they probably thought it was like a fun right-wing singer i think singing a song with lyrics that were for sure fun but also that they agreed with <laughs> I, I, it was my takeaway i guess like i don't they definitely didn't the crowd did not perceive that this was someone doing like a parody of a right-wing singer until like more than 10 minutes into the song when people started yelling that it was sasha um but yeah i mean i don't you know you'd have to ask those guys but but what you see is exactly what happened because we had to be so legally careful with that stuff because we were showing people's faces singing along to this inflammatory stuff that we couldn't really manipulate anything through the edit. Unfortunately, we had to, there was a fucking guy who sing Heil. <laughs> There's a guy who does a Sieg Heil um, in front of a Trump flag, which is like a, a shot that we found like going through the dailies and um, Amazon made us blur his face and the face of everyone else in there because of like, you know, legal being worried or whatever. But it was like, what? It was like, not only that guy's gonna sue us for making him look bad, he's like in public Sieg Heiling. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, okay, so my follow up question was you say, you said that Sasha was kind of being stormed and they had to get him to safety. Yeah. Is that the most, um, what was the most like dangerous situation you think he was in during? The filming of this movie it was probably that because a lot of people there had these semi-automatic weapons and someone did pull a gun and are like we had this really good security guy who was just like really calm um and we just like he just, he was just like really soft spoken he, he'd be like you don't want to do that buddy <laughs> like he was really good at dealing with situations another scene that totally got cut out 
but a guy uh, was in a house, he was in a house party, it was before COVID, and uh, a guy pulled a giant kitchen knife and was ready to stab him, and, uh, and that had to be defused. Uh, and that CPAC, that political conference we were at, that was just risky because we were like causing a ruckus and it was, we were just surrounded by Secret Service. And the only danger is that they didn't realize it was like a comedy thing or just like a stunt and thought that someone was trying to assassinate Pence, they would have, you know, pulled their guns and maybe killed them. So, uh, I, yeah. Way, you know, as far as any rats goes, there was one rat because I did hear <laughs> somewhere. Oh, there was a there, rat? There was a rat because I did hear somewhere that um, it's somebody we know that was in the Trump suit. It wasn't Sasha Baron Cohen. I forgot, I forgot the details of it though. Is that true? No, that was him. Really? I heard that it was someone else that was in the Trump suit. No, that was definitely him. That was him. Did I, where did I hear? Or I heard that somebody was in a suit or something. That's a disguise. false rat. That's, that rat is a double rat. Is, he's a double crossing rat because he's making up lives. Yeah, who did I hear that from? Wait. Yeah. There, so there's no validity to that, huh? There's no validity to that. Okay. Uh, okay. So the other scene I want to know about um, is the scene when they're at the debutante ball. Yeah. And that scene is insane. <laughs> and how did you set that up? That was this like cotillion society that does those balls that again, we approach as like, a, and this thing, yeah, they went to the newspaper and, and talked about it. They we approached as though we were filming, uh, you know, same similar kind of thing, documentary uh, style thing. And, uh, and uh, could we document, you know, could we film them? And that was another kind of big elaborate thing where we had to you know he couldn't be around people who knew he was but half crowd knew and we had to really figure out the night how to keep him out of sight but keep you know film him with enough of the crowd and and uh and just kind of orchestrate that night and that night got very ugly as well uh which which is not in the movie but um they came for me i was like i had my hair like bleach blonde and then my name was chris and they were confused at the end and drunk like a lot of these guys but they it was very clear that this like me like this little guy, Chris, was one of the, was like behind it. And we were just trying to get everyone out of this house and Sasha and Maria were out. And then I just hear like guys running down the stairs towards me going like, where the fuck is Chris? Oh, shit. <laughs> like, and I really, I was just like, who's Chris? I was like, oh, shit, I'm Chris. And like, <laughs> this tape, and like the camera guy was still up there. So it was eight guys ripping off their jackets, like coming for me. Uh, to like beat me up or something um so Wait, that what triggered this by the way what was what incited this the dance the dance got them okay, very... the dance after the dance happened there they thought oh did they think this was a prank pulled on them or did they think just how dare they do this eventually i think it was just like the dance happened and everything's like people started leaving and then I think around like coat check and like out front people like hang on like kind of playing back all the information in their heads. Like, wait, this seems like in hindsight, the whole thing was leading up to this dance. I feel like we got tricked. You know, I don't know what this is, but this was some kind of trick that was played on us. Um, so yeah, that's why I think they realized. Uh, I did hear, I heard someone, someone told me that someone in the front also was like at the very end was like yelling at people like, can't you see we've been bored at it. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that was when they got, got angry and, and tried to, you know, come, come after me. What was that event? Like ostensibly? It was like a debutante ball or cotillion. It was at this uh, historic house in Macon, Georgia. But like what, what happened? <laughs> what happens? Like, what's the point of that, that ball? Yeah, it's a weird, like this weird Southern tradition where like wealthy people present their daughters to society. And it's like very like, you know, it's it's kind of this very old fashioned thing where you, yeah, you walk down the thing, you're, I think it's like a young woman and she has like an escort and the fathers are like presenting her for, you know, um, we were trying to kind of equate it to like a, you know, cattle auction or whatever, but you, you know, you're essentially you're presenting your daughter to, to high society. What, remember, you in remember, real quick, remember, what was that line? It's kind of like the funniest line in in that scene where like, the daughter yells at her dad because oh, I think yeah, what did he what and that that was real too, right? Yeah, everything. everything was I mean, 
<laughs> it looked a little edited as well. I'm saying um, that little it, moment. It wasn't, wasn't changed at all. Uh, that was this guy that Bora was talking to and he's like, how much did you give me for? Right. How much for your daughter kind of thing. The guy's like $500. And then they're like laughing with each other. And she's like, dad, that's fucking gross. But no, that was, that was real. <laughs> I mean, but that, that seemed like he was, that guy was just joking, you know, right? I mean, I was just joking around. Yeah. Probably, but. Yeah, but yeah. my question is, do you have, um, did you have a disguise? I mean, you were being called Chris and had blonde hair. You dyed your hair blonde. Yeah, I bleached my hair. And you did this for safety so that no one would be able to know who you were later. No, no one knew who I. Don't care who I am. I, it was, uh, it was, because, it was so I look less Jewish, so people would trust me. <laughs> wow. Wait, what? Really? Yeah, that was the reasoning, but it worked. I mean, people. That uh, is so. Cr- Hold on a second. <laughs> who's who said you should do that? That you needed to look less Jewish. Um, Mr. Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen told you. Oh, oh wow. That's what I look like at the debut top ball. That is I just bizarre. Bizarre. You look like Robert Downey Jr. Yours a good look. You should keep keep rocking that look. I was like, well, that's I didn't see you guys all like last year. I was like blonde for most of the year. That does not. Look oh my like god. You. That wow. does not look like you. Does it look? Does he look Jewish? Well, did maybe. You, did your Did your wife was she into that look? No, she was not. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is that's crazy, Jason. I. So Sasha told you, I think you need to dye your hair blonde and you need to go by Chris? He was just, I think I might have come up with Chris because uh, it sounds like Christ, but he was just saying, he's like, we're going to be going a lot, shooting a lot in the deep south and a lot of these people, you know, like the whole idea is that we want people to be comfortable to reveal prejudices and a lot of people aren't like huge fans of, of Jews. And I mean, I never consider myself like super Jewy looking, but um, this definitely like people, people trusted me. So I, yeah, I, you know. I think it worked. It might. I don't know if it's because I looked less Jewish or this weird blonde hair with like dark eyebrows and like a blank expression. Like I just kind of came up like a sociopath. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so your eyebrows were the same color as now. I did not change my eyebrows. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Jason, because I this is the biggest insight I think right now from that from this little you know questioning is that you were blonde and you were playing a non Jew. You were non Jewish for this movie, but you weren't for the shot with the Tom Hanks thing, I guess, right? That's right, because that was the very last thing we shot, which was only about a month before the movie was finished, um, where we were, that was like, we wanted to make it clear that we didn't ambush Tom Hanks, so that was just like, it was kind of like very, you know, stagey on a green screen, like, uh, and so I had already, I dyed my hair back to brown the day before we shot Rudy Giuliani so I was like well that he didn't, like he's from New York like I was like can I please dye my hair back to normal that is bizarre how many months were you blonde um all last year so that was well okay no it's about half of last year because Rudy was in I think and and so that was uh, it was from the beginning we were shooting it in January so uh January so about half and did you experience feel like you experienced did did you have more fun <laughs> <laughs> I had more fun than most people in COVID just running around shooting this thing. But um, no, did being blonde change to the way that people treated you? And uh, did you notice that? And even in Los Angeles and stuff, when you're back home, you know, I would completely forget. I looked so crazy and you, you don't spend most of the day, like seeing your hair. It would just be like in the morning and I would look at the mirror and, and then you just kind of forget about it when you have like a weird look. Um, so yeah, it didn't, I don't think it impacted my, but also it was like COVID time. So I still wasn't, you know, from sync. March, I wasn't really seeing anybody. I was just at home with my family and then shooting this movie where, you know, we were in like a very weird mode of working. And uh, yeah. You've never done anything like that before, right? Change your hair color? Change my hair. I, I, I dyed my hair darker when I was like in high school and like really into like, you know, you know, not, I wasn't goth, but I was just like, I don't know why it seemed like I was into like horror stuff, I guess, or myths. I don't know. It seemed like a thing to do. I, I remember dyeing my hair black. Like real dumb. Would you say? Would you say you're legally blonde? I was legally blonde for a lot of. Time. <laughs> I mean, All right, that's look, enough for the. I, I mean, <laughs> I you know I, I'm sure we could keep asking questions about you know the Borat movie or whatever, but I can't, we we have we want to talk to you about other stuff too. You know, unless Doug, did you have other Borat questions? Um, no. Let's. We should move on. You know, we should move let's on. Let's talk from... about this. So speaking of, you know, you kind of played a role for this movie aside from the Tom Hanks scene. You played a role where you were playing this guy named Chris who's you know 
he was, I guess, Christian maybe, and blonde hair. You're playing an Aryan guy. Yeah, not, that's not the first time that you've played roles. I think he was just playing, he was just trying to look, he was like, all right, well, we already went over this, but I think the point of that look was to, to get people to not be afraid to like be anti-Semitic or something, right? No, I know, no, I know. Um, but he, Grant was segueing into, uh, I think, uh, that I was, uh, an a I used to act. Yes, yes, I know where he was going. You used to be, now I couldn't help but freshen up on your history, I like checked you out on Wikipedia a little bit. And I found uh, out a few things that I didn't know about or either I forgot about. Was that you were a child actor? I was, yeah. I did know this about you, but I, I, I kind of forgot actually also. Yeah. So how, how did you, uh, how, did, how did that start? And yeah, how many cereal commercials were you in? Oh my God, I did a lot of cereal commercials. That was the first commercial I ever did I was for Kix cereal, which I don't forget. That's still around. I, it's like a non-tasty cereal. It's like a, right? It's like one of those healthy cereals. Like no, that. it's not that healthy. There's, it's kind of sweet. Kids. It's not that. It's, it's, it's. Yeah, it would be like a healthy cereal because it's not super sugary. But it looks it's like it's little balls, so it looks like it's fun for kids. But then I never liked it. No, no offense. It feels very okay. like. Uh, let me just say that I am offended. It's definitely more sugary than um, than Cheerios, for example. Really? Yes. It's sweeter than Cheerios for sure. It's almost like a dialed down corn pops or something like that. You know? Okay. Or something yeah, like was, that. My dad was a children's birthday party magician as like a, uh, a side gig from being a shop teacher. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he would dress in like a big bunny suit and we would uh, go do kids birthday parties on weekends. And, uh, and I was like, I started when I was, I think, three. And I was like the plant in the audience where we would go to a kid's birthday party and I would like, he'd like call me up and then I'd show him and do his tricks and stuff. Uh, and um, someone pointed out many years later through that, uh, how weird it must have been. Kid's birthday. It was the kid they didn't know there who got called to like do the magic tricks with the magician. That is so funny. <laughs> Never struck me as odd. I, you know, we kind of, uh, Jason, you kind of broke up there on my end and I'm recording it. So can you just repeat that last part about the. Wake up. What part? How oh, just your, the, the magician part there. The my, revelation. My dad was a, a kid's birthday party magician. And I was like, when I was from my, around when I was three, uh, would would kind of we were like a two-man act but i would be like a plant in the audience and i would go to these kids birthday parties and just sit in the crowd and then and then he would like be like i need to volunteer and i would go up and like kind of show him up and do his tricks um which someone pointed out to me many years later must have been strange for the kid whose birthday it was uh that there was a, a child they didn't know there <laughs> uh, who was like doing all the tricks and that is hilarious so you have like a lifetime of experience for borat style that's true. I've been Stuff. training people since I could walk, basically. I was like, I was um, hoodwinking people uh, in their homes as part of my earliest memories. <laughs> uh, real quick, I just, I looked up kicks and I looked up Cheerios. Um, Cheerios coming in at nine grams of sugar per serving. I think kicks is next. And kicks... It's kid tested, parent approved at three grams per serving. Wait, what? So it's a healthier, less sugar content no. than Cheerios, brand. Not possible. Not possible. <laughs> That's not possible. That Cheerios is, it's Kix is definitely sweeter than Cheerios. Are you, wait, you're not thinking of Honey Nut Cheerios or one of the. Oh, yeah. You looked up Honey Nut Cheerios, Doug, I think. No, Regular I didn't. I have the. <laughs> I got the I graph right actually, here. I don't believe what you read because Cheerios has to have regular Cheerios. We're talking has to have less sugar than kicks. In fact, I, I remember reading that on the box too of Cheerios. It's, it showed an order of, of who had the most sugar. And I think kicks was had less sugar than a lot of sugar cereals, like shredded, you know, uh, frosted mini wheats and stuff or whatever, frosted flakes and stuff, anything frosted, you know, 
I guarantee uh, you, regular uh, cheerios. Kix is less. I'm sorry. No way. There's no yeah. way. I don't. I can't buy that. I don't buy that. I'm just looking at what I mean. Maybe it's fake news. This is what I'm looking at on the internet here. Okay, it's I'm pulling up. I'm pulling up the the information on the side of the box. Okay, what do you want me to do? Jason only. Jason only does commercials for healthy cereals. What What do you expect? All right. I'm gonna look it up now. <laughs> but um, so wait, where were you living when you were? Uh, where did you grow up? In the Bronx, in New York, and we we're living there. And then, yeah, they, at one of these magic shows, a woman was like, I you know, she knew I was the, his kid. I was like, your kid could, could be an actor and gave him a business card of a, a manager. So yeah, I acted throughout my, my childhood and, uh, and stopped when I was about 12, I think. Well, and how did you get out of that career without being all screwed up? You seem pretty regular, pretty, pretty balanced you know, person. I think I just knew I like I remember from even being like a little kid, people being like, "Oh, be careful! Child actors have terrible lives." And uh, I think I was fortunate enough to not become famous as a kid actor. I was able to like do some things. I did a lot of commercials. I I was in a movie called Weekend at Bernie's, kind of a '80s cult classic. A, a movie called a movie. Um, called yeah, a Bernie's little movie. Just- uh, some movie. It was. It just was called. <laughs> come on we know what that is come on weekend of bernie's that's a legend <laughs> it's a legendary film that's a legend not even a legendary film it's just a legend in itself and by the way just real quick i'm looking on one site right here that says Kix has three grams of sugar and it says cheerios has three grams of sugar i still don't believe that so they're saying they have the the same amount of sugar but right. i'm actually thinking that that's i still don't believe that okay carry on weekend of bernie's <laughs> uh yeah, that was, I did. So I did a show with uh, Ringo uh, from a from a band called the Beatles. <laughs> oh, by the way, Vic Berger wanted me to ask you about this because he, when I told him you were going to be on the show, he sent me that photo of you and Ringo, and he's like, "You got to ask him about Ringo. How did what happened with, so, when he met Ringo?" Wait, okay. when was this? He was this a was child. He was a child. Eight, I think. Eighty-eight. He says, "Okay." Ringo was the, he was a nice guy. We toured, we got to tour the country together. We got to like, we took a train from like Chicago to New York. I have home movies in the eighties of like my family playing charades with Ringo. Wait, what? Wait, 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 wait. Cool. Can we back up a little bit? What, what was this tour all about? It was like a press tour for the show. And that was also, I have this vivid memory of realizing that when Famous people say things in interviews. They're like pre-planned, like when they say jokes. Because we were on the Today Show, I think. And they were like, Ringo, why a kid show? And he's like, I like kids. I used to be one. And the host was like, ah. and then we, And then he said that same joke in every interview we did. He's like, oh, people just say the same things. This is, everything's fake, I learned when I was eight years old. Wow. That's, wait, that's, you look, wait that's everything's wild. fake because why? Because celebrities just repeat the same jokes in every interview. Right, 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 right. Um, but it was, yeah, he was fun. It was good. We did like 20, I think we did 22 episodes. And then they moved the show to Toronto. And I was replaced with a, a Canadian, a, a young Canadian actor. Um, and, and Ringo quit and George Carlin took it over. Damn. For him. So, so you're saying after the Ringo thing, that's when you, you hung up your acting hat. No, I did it a few more years. I had a, I did a show called, this was, uh, I did a show called Willie. I got cast to star in an ABC sitcom called Willie. That was like about a 12 year old kid who like made movies with his friends. And it was, made by these two guys who did the show Growing Pains. They were like the showrunners and they <laughs> left. The show called Growing Pains. <laughs> Come on, we grew up on that she. Okay. <laughs> Young listeners who probably don't know anything. Yeah, you're right. That's true. That's true. Growing and Pains is a legend. You know? Legend. <laughs> legend. You've got Weekend at Bernie's, Legend, Beatles, Growing Pains. You're, what if you were like, okay, uh, I was on this show with this guy, Ringo. He was in this band uh, this is like rock and roll band called the Beatles. <laughs> that's what he did. That's the joke he made. He made that joke. Right? Oh, okay. 
<laughs> I was probably looking up kicks ingredients still. Well, I know. Kind real of. quick, before this, so we can just move on from this. I just want to show you one thing real quick. I'm just going to share this screen. Just take a look. Um, this is all the cereals with all the grams of sugar in them. Oh, on, and I think this is per serving, I think. But as you can see right here, can you see my mouse? Cheerios, um, one gram. Yeah. One gram of sugar in Cheerios here. And in Kix, where is it? Uh, here, three grams of sugar. So Kix yeah. is, is up there as far as low sugar content. But, you know, Cheerios is number one, baby. Number one. And actually, look. This thing, Fiber One brand cereal has zero, actually. So that's actually number zero. But Probably actually, look, General Mills toasted oats. Anyway, you get the picture. So Okay, well, out. look, you, you pulled – you f you're like, uh, like a flat earther where you, you have your conclusion and then you find the evidence until no, it fits I, I, your narrative. I did, I did not. All I did was I typed in sugar content in cereals. That's all I looked for, you know? Uh-huh. This is the third result that we've got. Yeah, but I that was I I did a quick Google. I was looking for a real chart this time, like an official chart, and I found it that time. Okay, anyway, I'm just gonna say, regard irregardless, Kix is a low ass sugar content. That's true. Okay, yeah. so here's the thing. Um, did you? Uh, so that's but that's kind of crazy that you. And were you enjoying this child acting the whole time? Yeah, I was. It was fun. I never. I don't have any bad memories of it, except in hindsight, I do think one commercial director was uh, grooming me. To molest me is something I realized like a couple of years ago. Oh my God. How did you realize that a couple of years ago? I, there was this one director, I don't remember his name, but I did a lot of commercials with him. I'll, I'll go because I was going through, my parents sent me a bunch of boxes of like stuff from my childhood. I'm just going through them. And I found one uh, photo of me doing a commercial for this toy store called Kitty City. And I was by, they call it Video Village, where like the monitors and stuff are. And I'm sitting on this guy's lap and, and, uh, and we're taking a photo and I, and I was just like, I would never, I was working with a 12 year old boy. I would never here sit on my lap and take a photo like that. I was like, it felt like a little bit intimate, but then I had this flash memory that I hadn't thought of, you know, in, in, in decades where I remember this conversation with this guy sitting in these director's chairs. And I think I was telling him that like Pee Wee Herman was uh, my hero. And, and he was like, and he's like, you know, he's like, uh, you know, he is gay, don't you? And uh, I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's the thing is that when he was caught at that theater, the press was kind enough to say that it to, to, to leave out the fact that it was a gay porn theater. And, you know, it's like 12. And uh, I don't know if any of that's true. That's but, in inappropriate, no matter but, what. But he was like, yeah, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of famous people are actually gay. I was like, oh, in hindsight, I was just like, oh, I think he was like, I think I said that was leaving. <laughs> um, if we had spent a considerable amount uh, more time together. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I might have been being groomed. But um, I don't think anything happened unless I repressed that even deeper. But yeah, no, that was an interesting. What was the, what was the. What was the question? <laughs> well, the question was well, more like, so you were enjoying it and you were, and yeah, yeah. did you have aspirations to become a big star as a child actor? Well, I mean, did you? Everyone was like, don't become a big star. Look at all these child stars in the 70s who died. You don't want to do that. You're going to get into drugs. And like, but I, but so I remember thinking uh, that I, it was good that I kind of got to do all this stuff. And my parents were very cool. They weren't stage parents at all. They really did always tell me like, hey, this isn't fun. You don't have to do it. We're not doing this to get rich. And like, we're just doing this because it's fun. Uh, so it's very fortunate I had good parents. Uh, but and, oh yeah. Oh, go, I'm sorry, go on, carry on. Oh, uh, and, but then, yeah, so I was, okay. Oh, here's why I stopped. I was 12, I did this show. I got cast in this show. It didn't get picked up. Uh, it was like this kind of depressing sitcom because it was by these guys who came from like laugh track sit sitcom world, but it was like an attempt at a, early attempt at like a single camera sitcom which obviously like the office and stuff became very popular but in like 92 it wasn't anything so it was just like a sitcom where there would be jokes but then silence like so it was just like really weird tone didn't get picked up and then it came back and around that time oh i did like a play on broadway but then i was like going on commercial auditions and i got glasses i realized i needed glasses and i was really like self-conscious about it um and i went on an audition for some commercial 
And these guys, these like eight ad agency guys just started like laughing at me. And they're like, look at this, what we got, like a little Woody Allen here. Um, just because I was like a little Jewish looking kid with glasses. If I had blonde hair, it wouldn't have happened. But uh, I just remember thinking like, I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I standing like in rooms of assholes, like laughing at, I was like, I'm gonna, and I just told my parents like, yeah, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I think just like going through puberty and going to high school and saying, like, I think I just want to be a kid. So I, uh, yeah, I was just like, yeah, I think I'm done. Uh, that you had that sort of, uh epiphany at that age that you were kind of aware enough at that age to you know kind of realize you didn't like that what was going on with the ca casting agents and stuff and by the way back up three years prior or i don't know how old you were when that happened was you were 12 or 13 but back up to let's say 89 90 right and um this movie called home alone comes out and yeah. you see it and you think, okay, I want to be that. I want, I want to be, a, I want to be in the, the next home alone. I want to be Macaulay Culkin or what were you thinking? And you were thinking, I just need to dye my hair blonde. I think I probably auditioned for that. I know like there were some roles that he and I were like, there was a small pool. I think it was like, he, like, cause I think it was in New York. It was like, he was there. I think Elijah Wood was there. They're like a kid actor crew. And I never obviously made it nearly as far as those guys as a kid actor or as an actor or anything, but, um, but everyone kind of knew each other. Everyone knew each other's parents. Uh, but no, I didn't, I don't remember feeling like jealousy about successful kids, but. Or, or did you, but did you have aspirations to be, did you want to have your own, you know, movie where you're alone in a house? <laughs> <laughs> I think like, I remember feeling disappointed when I would get calls, be like, oh, they went with this other kid or, or whatever, um, which probably set me up well for like a life in the entertainment industry which is like mostly bad news and disappointment but because i think i just got used to assuming everything wasn't going to happen um but uh but i didn't i know remember like having dreams but i also remember like when i got that show i was like oh i'm gonna be famous i'm gonna be the star of a tv show yeah i'm sure i was like excited about that did, did you real quick i know you got something doug but did you um by any chance audition for child's play no i i don't I don't think so. I could ask my parents. I don't think so. Because I, I did. Really? Yeah. Because my, just briefly, my parents were trying to get me interested in doing acting as well, but I wasn't and I never did. And I went on like a couple auditions, but I didn't really, it wasn't something that we really pursued, but Child's, I did audition for Child's Play though. That's cool. To play Chuck, to play Chucky, the doll. Play the doll. Yeah. I was really good at sort of like making my, my, my body look like plasticky and hard and stuff. And I was like a really small kind of guy. No, I'm just kidding. But no, to play the kid in the movie. And I think I've probably already told this story before, but the, they had the kids saying bad words in the script, the B word and the SH word. And I didn't say those words when I was, you know, younger. And I don't really say those words now, actually, unless um, it's for comedic, it's in the comedy, of, in a comedy context. But anyway, um, I, that really tripped me up in the audition was saying these bad words. And I, I, I it was really hard for me to say them. Anyway, wh when the movie came out, I was really curious to see, I want to see this kid say these bad words, I, I, you know, because I, I can't imagine this kid saying these bad words. And they edited the they they edited that out of the movie or or out of the script or something because the kid I watched the whole movie the kid never said one bad word and I said why did I have to say those bad words anyway maybe that was just for the creepy uh, casting agent to right. watch the tapes later or something oh I do yeah actually now that now you mentioned it I did have to sit on his lap when I was saying the bad to say the bad words part only for the bad words part though I'd say okay for the bad words part why don't you come sit on our lap on our lap because I had to switch off between the two guys. So Jason, you say you, you can't imagine, like obviously that as a director now, having a child sit on your lap or something. So, but an adult is fine. So did you have Sasha sit on your lap during the shoot? <laughs> my lap quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> at the next scene while I was sitting on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's zoom ahead here to the last, um, to after your acting career, because when I remember, remember when we first met, you came into, when we were doing Tim and in. Eric, you came in yeah. and I don't know, that must've been almost 15 years ago or something. Like, like it was a yeah, while ago. One of the first people I think I met in LA, I was, I, I was just thinking about, cause um, 
I just remember even before I lived here, probably coming out to visit, we were doing that show with Human Giant, and we were just like, yeah, it was just like a little scene. But I remember talking to you at the Cha Cha Lounge. Is that what it was? And could like, have been, yeah, could have been. Like you were telling me, wait, is this? I don't know if this is a secret, but then you had like done some editing on like softcore porn or something, like many or like assistant editing or something, like, and you were telling me like about. You can cut this out if you want. Like, uh, dude, we're no, we're gonna get into this on After Dark. I'll tell you that much. After, like, yeah. oh yeah, a big part of the editing of that is removing the buckle. And I was like, what's the buckle? And you're like, oh, well, like uh, sometimes a fake boob will like fall in a way that reveals like a crease. And you know, most of what I have to do. I mean, this is like, yeah, like I guess early two thousands. And uh, and you were saying, yeah, that's what you guys. I just remember. I don't know why. I, I've forgotten most things that have happened in my life, but I remember that conversation uh and for the first time we ever hung out yeah like probably 15 years ago or something this is that's right my buckle yeah i mean <laughs> this is interesting stuff here yeah before i worked with tim and eric i moved out to la i knew one person and he got me a job at playboy.com so i was doing some editing of softcore porn and stuff on at playboy and yeah but then but i do remember i do remember um you you came to uh the offices and uh yeah we we you um tim and eric were like raving about you and then you were teaching us stuff you were getting uh, giving us tricks on after effects i think i was oh because yeah. yeah because you had an early screening they were talking about you had this early screening that we saw some uh some human giant it, and i it was the the magician sketch yeah yeah, yeah. we showed at UCB, um, yeah, Frank, and then I think we all hung out at La Poubelle after that. And I think it was the first time I hung out with Tim and Eric, and they were like, "Oh, we're making Tom goes to the mayor. You should come by." And then, yeah, I had this secret past uh, doing like educational materials for like After Effects and Photoshop, and I knew I knew a lot of hacks back then. <laughs> and I probably, yeah, probably did some. Yeah. So how did you parlay? Yeah. So what happened? Did you go to film school or or what? I didn't get into like I applied to NYU. I didn't get in, and uh, and then I just I, so I went to the school Sarah Lawrence just because I wanted to stay close to home, and I figured I would drop out pretty quick. I stayed there for two years and took like film classes, but they didn't have like a real film school. But um, I was able to just make some shorts and shoot some stuff, and then I like had this idea I would make a feature with my friends, and I convinced like a bunch of high school friends to also drop out of college. We made this like terrible feature length movie that luckily no one ever seen tried to like tour it around the country it was like a complete disaster and then uh i was just gonna like give up and and go back to school um when i like had got a call from a guy i'd run into in a coffee shop and he's like hey i'm opening this like educational like software education editing studio in upstate new york if you want to work there and i was like yeah I'll, I'll yeah i'll give it a shot and then i want to work in there four or five years this company called total training that uh, doesn't really exist anymore but um that was where I learned all that stuff. I mean, I taught myself a lot of stuff and then I was doing it and then also kind of started making like shorts again and started showing them. And that's when I, I was working there. I kind of was hanging out a lot and met those human giant guys and we started doing stuff together and kind of was able to crawl my way back into doing stuff uh, in my early twenties, I guess. So how, yeah, how did you, how did you link up with Aziz and Rob and, and the rest? <laughs> and the rest. <laughs> <laughs> um i was uh i was in new york those guys were in new york that ucb theater was like a very exciting place at the time and and aziz had a weekly show and i was doing like a man i probably showed some of your stuff i was like producing like a monthly comedy short this is like before youtube or anything they're doing like a monthly shorts thing and showed like early Tim and Eric stuff like cat film festival and stuff and uh and and just trying to find good stuff and, and show it and then met Aziz through that and started doing videos with those guys uh and then we got got really lucky and just got an MTV show uh yeah pretty pretty quickly and that Brent that's around when we met too I remember talking to you at like a party probably 15 years ago and you were yeah. doing some there's some bad situation with them with some like twilight zone kind of oh thing. that's right yeah that's right yeah there was um i that was well that was like um uh, yeah there was a show called room 401 on mtv that i got cast a host and i shot eight episodes of it and um the weekend before it was gonna air 
um, they, this guy, I won't even say his name, but this guy at MTV, who you, you, we, it was a name that we shared in common because he was, I think, probably oversaw some stuff at him for Human okay. Giant or whatever. I don't say his name, but yeah, it's probably not. Um, but he didn't, <laughs> he just thought that my vibe, when I was kind of doing like a Rod Serling kind of thing, yeah. like I was wearing a suit and I was kind of being, creepy and funny kind of or whatever that was sort of the the angle and um pr production was totally into it ashton kutcher produced the show and he really liked what i was doing and this guy billy rainey he um he directed a show called the real world on mtv and uh he was uh i know i'm just kidding get out of here and he, uh, <laughs> he, he was he was happy with what i was doing but then this guy this executive at mtv he he took over for these other people who had gotten laid off because there was all these layoffs at mtv and he didn't want there to be any suits unless it took place in an office setting or something like that. So I think, you know, Human Giant was allowed to have suits because there was, if it was in an office or something like that, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is, but anyway, he didn't, he didn't like my vibe or anything like that. And they replaced me the weekend before they reshot like a couple episodes with just the hosting segments with this actor named Jared Padalecki, who's in the show called Supernatural. And that show deserves a show called even though that show is still on the air i heard or something like that which is crazy that it's been on the air for that long did you know that supernatural has been on that for that long it's crazy that's one of the shows that you hear about that you no one you know has ever seen and is like 100 right watch it every this week. is this, this is this is where a show called is fair enough to use yeah. you know and yet the show's been on forever and uh so anyway, they replaced me with him and there was like kind of some cross promotion because it was like Supernatural and Room 401 was supposed to be kind of a scary kind of prank show or whatever. But anyway. Did, but yeah. did Room 401 air? Uh, yeah. The sh yes, it did. Yeah. But with this actor named J Jared Padalecki. Right. Yeah. Uh, ran out. No, I remember. I don't know why. I, I don't remember almost anything about my life except these two conversations that we had. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember, I remember us talking about it at a party. And I actually remember you guys showing was, uh, Illusionators at the at UCB Theater. I was at, I don't know, maybe you showed it multiple times. But I remember seeing it. It was before it was out yet. But I remember seeing like a little test screening of Illusionators. It's called Illusionators, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, at, at UCB Theater at one of the shows. It was either Comedy Death Ray or... Yeah, we showed a lot of stuff at that. Yeah, or, hey. yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I clearly remember meeting you and you were, yeah, you were a After Effects expert and then we watched Illu Illusionators and there's this scene where John Glazer like gets his mind blown by a, a trick and then yeah. it just like, it just like lingers on him and I thought that was like so funny how it just kind of, he's just sort of like walking around in a daze, like he, his whole life has changed now. And he like, everything he thought was real is not exist or something. And it's very I depressed love that. and he walked, ultimately, yeah, that's all, all Glazer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. No, that, Human Giant had some great, some hilarious sketches. You know? Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's the, like, I haven't watched most of that stuff in a long long time yeah it's uh it was fun it was it was it was fun to do this crazy little i mean it seems as though anything you work on is great i mean he for people who don't know i mean jason i mean this is something we should have said up front we will, we will again but he did the the brett gelman specials on adult swim i edited um, at least one of those that's right was it the first one yeah. i might have done two i might have done two of them <laughs> I love that first, the first one. one for sure for sure the first one with the parents because so you just don't even know you know you don't, there's no uh, there's no you know uh expectation yet or anything it's the first one is so I love that first one so much but um oh, thanks. And, uh, you know Jason did you did Eagle Heart too right I did yes yeah. Eagle Heart is awesome I mean, I mean that he show. show I mean Jason he does them all he does them all yeah he does all the shows I mean Jason does all the shows well, thank you guys. <laughs> True though, you do all the shows. You're the top. You're one of the top comedy oh. directors in the world. That's very true. kind. To say, I mean, that's very nice. Of you. It's true. I mean, I'm and we are honored to have you on the Poundcast. We're honored. Yeah. I've been a and... listener. I love both of you guys. Even if we weren't friends, I would love the show. I love the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're looking for. Okay. I have this. I mean, I'm sure you guys get. Too, like it's tough like when you just like 
listen to podcasts your friends do you feel like you don't need to talk to them that's why i, I haven't talked to anyone in like many years because everyone has podcasts and it just like fulfills that part of your brain where i like i listen to like the best show and then like my brain will think that i've talked to sharpling <laughs> like for the next week but it's just tricking you like these are fake, fake like you're not really uh talking to someone right you're just a podcast it's, it's an interesting yeah, like, phenomenon of I was just going to say like my, this podcast is like an excuse to talk to friends like you who I haven't talked to in a while. And, you know, we have to, we're locked in, you know, we have to talk. We can't. It's good, right? It forces you to actually, uh, you know, talk, especially in uh, these COVID times, you really have to, to, have to make an effort to. Uh, actually, yeah. Um, the, it, that reminds me before, I mean, we'll wrap up pretty soon. I know you probably have to go, but the, this is fun, the somebody, somebody was saying that, you know, there's, when there's fans of podcasts, you know, um, they listen to you so much, right? Week after week. And then they feel like they know you. And I've been told this before by people who have maybe gotten to know me or my voice or something from listening to me so much. And then they feel like they know me and they have to kind of check themselves and, and realize this is not, he doesn't know me. At, you know I mean? I only know him. And so there's this weird dynamic where it's, it feels like they have been having conversations with <laughs> It's like what you're saying, except it is just so it is a weird kind of phenomenon. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, because when when people do meet you in the real world, you're not like this at all. You're like, what? Do you I know want? you're all like a hardcore and stuff. You're like you know, hardcore, like, yeah, and your you're voice. Like, you're not all nice like this. Like, hey, I'm Brent. You're more like. You're all blonde and hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> you're all Chris like. You know, you're not Jason like. You know? Yeah, this is my podcast persona. All right, what Jason. Well, look. I, Good. I like. I, 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 oh, I, please, 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 please. Yeah, I. Uh, I don't want to rush you guys. This is really fun. Oh, if, I just. You can be done if you want. I'm sorry. Say that again. What? Uh, whatever. 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 You. I could probably do like ten more minutes if. Uh, oh yeah. That. Whatever. Yeah. I mean. But but uh, but if you want to be move on, that that's fine too. No 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 no. I I was I was just trying to be um you know. We know you, uh, yeah, we know you have uh, family obligations. You have a child now. A two, actually, yeah. You got two now. Wow, two congratulations. Boys. You have a girl and a boy? I had one. No, two boys. Uh, two boys. We had one uh, in, in COVID times uh, in uh, May. Now, no. what did you, what'd you name them? I'm surprised you didn't name your kids um, Aziz and Rob, and then the third one being called the rest. When you have and the movie. rest and all the rest yeah oh. they were on the list yeah <laughs> um well no and look if, uh, if that's all your questions that's that was great that was, <laughs> that was great yeah i mean i was oh, counting I, down to the hour because i knew you were leaving so i was just kind of like buttoning it up just, but yeah. yeah exactly i was trying to like i was trying to like just oh, yeah. through a lot of questions and stuff because i could i could keep asking you about child acting and you know that's like i don't want to rush you through that stuff that was because uh she talked so much about borat but uh but no interesting you know done we could, we could go so nine more minutes right? <laughs> <laughs> um well what's next what's next on your agenda oh i got you know i got stuff i want to make i'm trying to make a movie and some other stuff but it's early early times yeah what's up with features and you yeah, I have a movie I wrote I'm trying to make. We'll see. I th what's up with features at, at all? What's the world going to be like? What are movies anymore, right? That's a bigger conversation, but I don't know what, uh, I don't think anyone knows what movies are when this is all said and done. Well, this is going to be a movie when it comes out on YouTube, you know, <laughs> this conversation. I mean, you know what I mean? It's, con it, it's, it's yeah. feature length. That's true. That's it's a, true. more of a talking head documentary, but still, you know. Yeah, I've been, uh, yeah, what's up with movies now? Because I watched... There's a lot of movies out there. I mean, if you look at movies that are being released in 2020 and 2021, there's like a lot. And I've, I watched a few and then I always want to just like watch an older movie. I don't know. The newer movies, there's a lot of not good movies out there is what I'm saying. So we yeah. need you, Jason, out there to be making movies because there's a deficit of good ones. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, I'm trying. I got a movie. What kind of movie do you want to make? I've got like this epic movie, I, not like epic movie, that parody movie, but just like kind of a big story uh, that I'm trying to make um, that we'll see. We're just trying to start figuring out how to 
get money for it. And I just think no one, uh, I mean, I know we know like superhero movies will come back and we got some avatars coming up, but I think everyone's trying to figure out if uh, what will happen with movie theaters and if you can still make money from movies and justify the cost of movies. And yeah, I don't know. It's a big question mark right now. What genre is your film? It's a, it's kind of a mix. It's kind of a mix. <laughs> it's kind of a so It's kind of softcore porn, kind of like yeah. buckle, buckle heavy uh, softcore porn. <laughs> it's buckle heavy. Um, no, buckle, <laughs> buckles are cool now. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a comedy. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, here, going, let's get real quick. Let's circle back real quick to um, Human Giant, okay? When you, what, okay, you're kind of maybe going to comedy shows in New York and stuff, and how did you approach, how did you connect with, you know, Rob and Paul and, you know, the rest? <laughs> how did you connect with them initially to say, hey, I, I do video work or whatever, or I, I'm, I make videos, and do you guys want to collaborate? I mean, wh wh how, how did that connection happen? Yeah. Actually, because I was very shy. I never, like, I, I have, a, like, a real aversion to any kind of, like, hustling or, like, I was never, like, at shows handing DVDs out or anything. I did see that there were people I thought were really funny who, when they would make videos, were not very good. And I knew how to, like, package, like, music and, you know, graphics and stuff. So I was like, oh, I think I, I can, like, you know, like, help help people I like make stuff that feels more packaged or, or like higher production value but wait why did i get oh i like did you approach somebody after a show aziz maybe after a show or something I never approached anybody uh we i was doing this show this monthly show i started making videos i think with this guy frank lesser who uh, i'm still friends with who was like a writer on uh colbert report uh and for a long time and like he's just like a comedy writer guy in new york we started making like political videos together mm -hmm. and then he knew some comedy people like like rafifi world uh like eugene merman and bobby tisdale used to have this show called uh invite them, them up. up yeah yeah and and i would go to that like every week and there that was like a, a real scene and uh and then these two guys, uh, Bobby Tisdale and this guy Craig Baldo, had an idea. Yeah, DJ, DJ Baldo. Is it, yeah. <laughs> you know, he had a whole act called DJ Baldo. I don't know if you know that, DJ oh, Duckham, but yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that part of it. Uh, they had an idea for a video called The Pleaser Twins that was, like, about them as these two guys who just want to, like, make people happy and please people. And they asked Frank, and Frank asked me to work on it. Uh, and so we shot it, and it was, like, this 20-minute – Thing. it was really long <laughs> and they had this crazy like story where they were part of some college humor tour and they went to some college like Ithaca or Cornell or something and showed this video and it made the audience so angry they like stormed the stage and like tried to kill them and like the video itself didn't really work out but a few people saw it and I think Aziz saw it and thought it had like good production value and I had also and I had seen a video that he made while he was still at NYU about it was like this like thing about him punching a wall, which was his first one man show. And so we, we had each other's like email phone numbers. And then he saw that video and he's like, Hey, me and Rob Hubel are, had this idea to do a thing about child talent agents. Would you shoot it for us? And so, and, and, uh, and, and that was the first human giant thing. And so that, yeah, it was all just like very organic. I was just like, Oh, if I'm yeah. good and I just kind of hang out and, and don't really force myself on people or hustle. I, I was just hoping that, you know, the right kind of and human giant kind yeah. of after doing the the, show, the tv show that kind of really led the way to a lot of these other bigger projects that you've done as well right i mean that was kind of the fir first big stepping stone right yeah that was a big that was like my first tv show and i was lucky that they let me direct most of it and uh and then yeah everything just kind of happened organically i, I like that kind of i did that and moved out here and did a bunch of little things for a couple of years and then met with um, Michael Komen and Andrew Weinberg who had written the pilot for Eagle Heart. That was like a pretty different show at the time. And we started working on that. We did that for I think three or four years and yeah, everything just kind of like, kind of let you know. Do you, rem do you remember the pitching process for um, Human Giant? Like 
we didn't pitch it. That was the other crazy thing was like we had we made that thing Shutterbugs about these kid town agents. We made that magician thing like all on our own. And then we made this thing with Aziz. It was just me and Aziz made this thing where he had to take a boombox around the East Village, like playing like shitty songs. And I remember that. And so we put the three of those on a DVD. And he went to the the Aspen Comedy Festival, which I think he won that year. And I, I was the, I was there that year too. That's actually where I met Aziz. Was that in two thousand six at the at the Aspen Comedy Festival? And they showed. I saw that video, that boombox video there. Yeah, I guess I wasn't there. I guess it did well. And he had. He already had like a manager and and I think they passed it on that DVD of like those three videos to uh, MTV and uh, and they were just like, we want to show like this, which actually I think they mostly just wanted that boombox video because it was kind of like cranky and real. And we wanted to do like sketch comedy kind of stuff. And so that was always like the big fight is that they wanted us to include like more like real stuff or pranks or, or something, but we weren't really interested in that. But um. But yeah, so we didn't have to like sit down and pitch it. I mean, that's like the hardest, you guys know, like the hardest thing about doing anything is like sitting in a room with people and trying to convey what it is through like this song and dance, like pitch process is, is really the worst. Um, and uh, yep. and so lucky on that, that people just saw our videos and they're like, hey, do more of that for MTV. And, and you know, we got to do a pilot and then did the show. By the way, Aziz, I think tied that year with, he tied for best comedian with um, Mitch Fatel, the comedian Mitch Fatel. Never heard of Mitch Fatel. New York, New York based comedian. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> cool. Interesting. There was a lot of people who went to Aspen that year that went on to do a lot of big things. Anthony Jeselnik was there that year. And, um, Kristen Shaw was there that year. And, um, uh, and some other people who didn't go on and D Ray Davis was there that year. And, uh, who was and, there that didn't do shit? Huh? <laughs> well, I mean, there was people who just, you know, that it wasn't I, well, no i mean they do still good no i mean nick dune was there that year too um and uh i don't know but also people you probably you guys don't know is what i meant like i don't know my friend ryan stout was there that year and um um like a real aspen historian brent should do a show called aspen stories <laughs> about that specific uh festival that, you know that year who that was there year. who won who tied you know who didn't do shit you know all that stuff Right, right, right. Oh, um, the whitest kids you know were there that year. That was one of the, my favorite things I saw there. Was the whitest kids you know. Their their show was so hilarious. Their live their live sketch show. See their live show. I think we had like kind of like a because I think we both had shows at the same time, so we were like rivals, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess. So, oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And then oh, I remember I saw the Walsh brother. I met the Walsh brothers there, and they were really funny too. I remember seeing them there. Walsh brothers were there that year. Yeah. yeah, Brendan and his and his brother who went missing ten years ago, John. <laughs> no, I know the Walsh brothers. I'm just kidding. There, there was a that was a crazy time, and it, actually Chelsea Peretti was there that year too. Yeah, we were all babies. That is our, you know, a lot of a lot of people. We know. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't there, but it sounds. I like wasn't there. So, no. well, cool story. Me and uh, Jason weren't there. All right. Well, it's just kind of neat, you know. Maybe <laughs> weren't. Stories you can kind of create what it felt like to be there and kind of yeah. take it back back in time. What year was it? Twenty oh, two thousand six. It was February, I guess, maybe February of two thousand six. Like well, Jason, we've gone an extra twelve. So thanks for uh, giving us those bonus minutes. Appreciate that. Hey, the bonus, you just you yeah. heard the bonus twelve with uh, Jason Wallner. <laughs> yeah, and Brent and I are going to keep talking for another who knows how long. And if you want to listen to that, go to patreon.com slash poundcast and you can get instant access. Guys, thank, sorry, I have to run. Thanks so much for oh, having me. okay. No, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. And it's great catching up and catching, catching down too. And the past stuff. And real quick, if you like the show, you can, I don't know, whatever, find it on wherever you listen to it and rate it and review it. And also if you- I will. You know, and, and yeah, that this, that was I was directing that to. That's to you. only for you, Jason. Yeah, only for you, Jason. And also, um, thank you to Chloe Bonilla, Jack Birch, and um, Jackie Montana for uh, helping us out. Yeah. You telling me that still? Yeah, just that's just for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank those guys. It's been great. All right, thanks, Jason. You can hang up at any time. We're just gonna keep right. doing, doing the rest of our thing here. But yeah. thanks a lot, and yeah. hope to see you soon. Yeah, and maybe one of your backyard screenings, you know, looking forward to that picking up again.
yeah, we didn't even get into. No, this was fun. It was really fun uh, catching up with you guys. Yeah. And, uh, think about the old days. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. I'll talk to you guys. See you. Bye. See ya. Bye. Bye. Talking on.